Well, good evening. Thank you for coming and being with us tonight at Southside Baptist Church. Those that are watching, we have a, a good crowd present tonight, and we certainly thank you for uh, being with us tonight. I just wanna, I'm going to do the missionary moment in time. I just want to just share a little something with you. I know we're winding down, and a lot's been given. But, but, Last year, we gave $7,000. Uh-oh. We ain't even got 6000 yet. We're like $1,500 more. So let me just encourage you to give. And in the next two weeks, if we can, you know, I'll give if you'll give. And... uh we can uh, get that up, and I don't know that we'll make 7000 That's okay, but I do want to get over 6000 That'd be all right. That's way more than what we asked for. I don't think that'll be too hard for us in two weeks, do you? Shouldn't be. So just encourage you there, encouraging word to help, help these folks. I want to share with you tonight about one of our, these folks right here uh, that we're, this money will go to and help, and it's a, a young lady named Brianna McKinney. She's out in Colorado. Brianna is uh, in a program that, that these folks do where they send college students out into the missionary field while they're in college to help the missionaries to do the work that they do, and so instead of say, going to spring break or whatever, they, the folks with the North American Mission Board, when these folks get out of college for the summer, they go and they send them to the mission field to work with some of the other missionaries that have already, and they help them plant church, and they help them do feed, they help them to do whatever they need to do in the ministry they do, they're a help for them. And maybe... Uh, somewhere down the road, they, you know, this is a step for becoming a missionary yourself. And so this young lady named Brianna McKinney, that is what, what she is. And she said that she was so thankful that God led her into this. And they assigned her to Denver, Colorado, is where she went to. They called these young folks out of college that they send into the mission field to help the missionaries out, they call them journeymen, the journeymen. And this would be, I guess, a journey lady here, but that's, that's what they call them. But she was the first one that they started this program with. And uh, they go alongside, it said, with the missionaries and church plant to help them assist and expand the work that they're doing. So they just fit right in them. But this is what she said. She said the city of Denver has one of the greatest spiritual needs. She said in Colorado, people are often isolated and lonely. And Denver has, listen to this, I'm shocked. 
Well, I shouldn't be shocked. But it says the city of Denver has only one evangelical church, one church that tries to reach out to the lost, be evangelist, evangelical like us. They only have one church for every 32,000 people. One church. That ain't the worst part. Listen to this. To put that in perspective, there's one marijuana dispensary for every 2,000 people in Denver. There's one brewery in Denver for every 7,000 people. So they've got more marijuana places by far and more breweries and places like that than to have churches in Denver, Colorado. Ain't that a sad state of affairs there? She says our goal is to hope and uh, uh, our goal, our hope, and our vision is that a number of these can be switched and we're now in an ambivalent, listen to this though. She says our goal, our hope, and our vision is that these numbers can switch. And we are now one evangelical church for every 7,000 people where we live at. And we're seeing people come to faith in Jesus every day, she said. So God's still working, even though we may not see it as openly and expressively as, and don't hear a lot about it even in our our uh, magazines and stuff we get from the Baptist Convention, I want to tell you they are still people being saved, and every dollar that we put into it, we have a part in their salvation. If you got your Baptist Courier this week, I don't know if you read it or not, but about the second or third page in, it didn't talk about these missionaries, but it talked about the missionaries all over the world and the trouble and the and the countries where they're being most persecuted at and killed. And I don't know, it must have listed, what, close to 30 countries or something like that in there where they're being killed every day. For the God. China was one of them. China was one of them. A lot of those countries, I didn't know where they were. Some of them I did. But there's a lot, but I'll tell you what, the great majority of them were Muslim countries. Almost every one of them was a Muslim country, and they kill Christians if they know you're a Christian there. Egypt was one of them. Egypt's our buddy, so to speak. Saudi Arabia was one of them. All those very strict Islamic countries, and they kill Christians. But we want their oil, though. And they want our money, so we appease them, and we never say anything about what they're doing to the Christians in the Christian churches over there. And I think that's a sad state of affairs there, myself. That's right. But anyway, that's enough. I'm going to get on my high horse now. But I read that, and I read all them countries, and I read all those that were dying every day for Jesus. But it'll be okay one day. I promise you. All right, I'm going to have our prayer Mimi's going to come and lead us in our song for tonight. We're going to pass the offering plate for our WMU ladies. I, I talked to Miss Colleen about a, uh, something that we may be interested in helping in. We go look at it at the church, and some of this money may go to help fund something that that I got a text about this week. But we'll, but it'll all be put to good use, though. I promise you, always. So let's pray. God, as I read this today in the Courier, and, and then I, or this week in the Courier, and, and then I read this from Brianna out in Colorado, talking about the lostness of that place, where there are more, by far, marijuana places and bars and stuff. Evangelical, evangelical church is one for every 32,000 people. That's a sad, sad place there. But God, I pray for them. God, they're out there working in a very tough, tough place. It ain't always easy serving you, God, for those folks. And then I read about those all over the world and those foreign countries. 
that every day their life is on the line. We'll never know who their names are. But God, you know where they are. And God, you know what they're going through. God, I pray that if we can do a little something to help them, God, we'll do that. God, bless them. Bless the carrying of the gospel into all the world. Bless the offering we're about to take up now. And God, may you multiply it many times. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, Mimi's going to come and... and uh, Lead us in our song soon and very soon. Our ushers will come and take up your money. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, Mimi. At this time, we're going to have our uh, special music for tonight. I've asked a dear friend of mine, and been to this church many times, to, to come and sing for us tonight. She hadn't been here in a, a little while, but Miss Cindy, we're glad to have you come and sing for us tonight, Cindy.
mercy and a heart full of love. He really cares when your head is bowed low. Consider the lilies and then you will know. Consider the lilies and then Consider the lilies. If you consider how much God loves them, and He says He does in His Word, then you got to consider how much He loves you. That's what He does. And then that one of the lines in that song that she just sung says, We have a God that cares about us. If we can ever get that set in our heart, in our mind, that we have a God that sees us and knows us and cares about us. A prime example of that is Daniel. Daniel was one of the most special men in the whole Word of God. God gave him visions beyond measure of what was coming in the close time toward him, but in the scripture that we get in tonight, Daniel, there's a term, remember when we get here, that Daniel had had a vision that shocked him and made him sick. Three weeks, he had prayed, he'd been sick, and he had not got a word. And I explained that to you. I don't need to go back into it again about the demonic battle between heaven and earth. But it goes on and has been going on, and you and I never know much about it because it's above us, but it's below heaven. But somewhere in there, the demons of darkness and the demons of lightness battle as we even meet here tonight. Now, I want to tell you, in this scripture, it, it begins to change some and uh, gets a little confusing, and I have to be careful because I'm going to be honest with you. I've got four or five authors and stuff that I read concerning this stuff, but almost every one of them does not deal with this right here. They come up to this point, and then they go on to the 11th chapter. They do not deal with this. So I've had a struggle, and I told Rhonda this week, I said, this is killing me. I said, ain't nobody I read tells me about this. So I, I prayed, and I tried to put something together, it would be interesting, but this is a strange moment in the book of Daniel. And in this scripture, we, we read last week in verse 13 about the prince of the kingdom or, or the demons of Satan and how he prayed for 21 days. And then it says, But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remi remained there with the kings of Persia. So Michael battles through. The first messenger God sent could not handle all the things that Satan was throwing at him. So he battled, but he was losing. So God taps his main man, Michael. And he says, there's a man down there named Daniel. He cannot handle what he has heard. He cannot handle what he has seen. So I need for you to go and get on through and get down there and tell Daniel and lift him up and let him know that I know what's going on. So he says in verse 14, he says, Now I am come, this is Michael, to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter day. That's what through Daniel for a loop right there. That term, latter days. He was going to show Daniel, and, and, and when you get into chapter 11 about the battle and the war and all that, what you're going to find in there is a lot of that is a repeat stuff that I have told you 
in the previous verses, remember about the, um, the beast, remember about the idol, the four kingdoms and all that. I, listen, I went back to you for a year with that. This kind of refers it back. And he kind of goes over that. He gives Daniel the whole picture from the first vision to the last vision in the 11th chapter. A lot of that I will not repeat to you. But he gives him another vision that he'd never seen before. And he called that vision the vision of the latter days. The vision, and when Daniel began to see what was coming at the end, what was heading with the Antichrist and the end of time things that we've talked about forever here, Daniel, he says, I became dumb. God packed so much in that vision that Daniel could not understand it at all. Why? Because if you lived when Daniel lived 2,600 years ago, it'd be very difficult for you to understand the things that God is saying concerning things that have not even happened yet in our lifetime, wouldn't it? It'd be hard. It, it, it'd be strange. It's kind of like 25 years ago before we started hearing and they started doing all these uh, video games, and they started doing all these movies about the end of time and, and, and the last days of earth and all these things that have come about in the last 15 or 20 years. Some of them are somewhat accurate. Most of them are not very accurate because they're not based on the Bible. But Daniel comes down. I mean, Michael comes down. And I want, tonight I want to speak to you just a minute. This will be a little different what you've been hearing. Next week, we'll get back into other stuff. But this was a special time in Daniel's life. Something he'd never, he'd heard a lot. But when he begins to break it down to him, how things are going to be, it is more than Daniel can take. He'd never heard anything like this and all the other things. So he sends what I consider, and this is just me, his top guy from heaven. Because this is an important vision that's coming. So he doesn't send just anybody. He sends Michael. Why is Michael so important? I read Dr. Jerry Vines, is, and that's going way back because I hadn't read him in a while, but he's solid. I read what he had to say about Michael the archangel. And Dr. Vines said this about him. He said he believed that Michael was the archangel that was on special assignment over the nation of Israel. God had said, you're going to see them. Why Michael? You remember when Moses, the great patriarch, was buried? Satan tried to get the body of, a, of Moses. He tried to get Moses' body. And he and Michael, the Bible tells us, were in great dispute over who was going to claim the body of Moses. And of course, Michael won out. But there's a story, he says, in that. He said, if Satan had gotten the body of Moses, then that would have meant a victory for him over the Lord. And God could never let Satan have final victory over him, so he sends the best he's got. Because that was a, a, a very important time in history. So he says, Michael is God's special angel. He looks out the nation of Israel here. It says in there concerning this, that there are angels that look out not only as they did Moses, but for you and I. And one day we'll come up out of the grave and we'll have a brand new body, resurrected because we've been protected from Satan by the angels of God. When Jesus came out of the tomb, who was waiting on the outside? Angels. Waiting to be sure what? That nobody, we ain't got him, that they could not lie about what happened that first Easter morning 
because God had his special witnesses seated outside that tomb because this had to happen that Easter Sunday for it to become an Easter Sunday. Jesus had to be resurrected. That too. But I want you to notice something. Those angels sit outside waiting, didn't they? To be sure what? That the wrong people didn't roll that stone away. Because they claim that somebody stole his body. Some did. But the angels sit there to be sure that none of that happened. When Jesus come out of that tomb, and when he stood out, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he that believeth in me shall never die. Jesus was standing in what we call a glorified body. The body he went in with was not the body he came out with. The Bible said he had a glorified body. The Bible also says that one day when we leave this world, whether we die, whether we fly, whatever happens, if you go into a cemetery or somewhere, whatever happens to you, you're cremated, whatever. Don't matter to me. When that trumpet sounds, you're going you're gonna to get a new body. That, then, when the Bible talks about the graves being opened, I am telling you, there are people that have been in them graves for thousands of years. They ain't coming out there. But there will somebody come out there. It'll be me and you in a glorified body. It says in the Bible that we'll have Now, while we're protected, Satan can't come get us. He can't get our loved ones. He can't get me and you because we're protected by the angels of God. If he could steal one body, take it away from God, He'd have a victory that he should never have had. But he cannot do that. Daniel was going through a great victory now. Now what you see is this. God sends an answer from heaven. He sends that answer through an angel. It was not what Daniel was expecting. He says on further in that scripture, And when he has spoken such words unto me, when he told me what was going to happen, what happened to him? I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. You know what Daniel's saying? I didn't have a clue what he's talking about. He was talking about way beyond me, and he did not understand it. Now, when he had the dreams of the visions of the statue, the, the gold, the silver, and the brass, and all that we've talked about, he understood that. That was his time. But you see, he is talking to him about not just beyond his time, but beyond mine and your time in this vision. Things that we have not seen yet. Things that maybe we can't even imagine yet. Could you imagine if you was told that 2,600 years ago? Daniel said, I could not understand what in the world was going on. I became dumb. So he'd, <laughs> he'd gotten up after the 21 days of being out. He tells him the vision, and what does he do? He falls back to the ground again. It was not what he expected. You got to realize Daniel now is approaching 90 years old. He's in his mid to late 80s, what they tell me as I read this stuff here. And he said, And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of man touched my lips. And I opened my mouth and spoke and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord. By the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. I want to just share with you. I, put, I had some notes somewhere that we typed up. I don't even know what I've done with them. They in here somewhere. 
Maybe I can find her. Can't, maybe I'll remember it. <laughs> Story of my life. So he's overwhelmed with what he's seen and what he's heard. And what he says is to him. Now, this is what I, you know, I only know what I get by what I read and pray and think the Holy Spirit tells me. But when I read all these smart people, there are many of them that say that this was possibly the Lord himself that touched his lips. I can't confirm that, but that's what many of the authors say. I do know that when he addressed him, he called him Lord in that scripture. So I don't know. But I read, and probably most of them had that picture of him. I don't know that that's true. I can't confirm or deny that it was. But I can tell you that this vision was so unworldly and something he'd never dreamed of that he went back to his knees again in this. And then he asked the question in verse 17. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? How can I talk to a holy God? How can I talk to the Lord? How can I do? He didn't understand when he asked that question. He didn't understand how he would feel that closeness to God here. That he could talk to his Lord, he said, in this scripture. But I love this verse. This, this, this will tie in so much of what I preach this morning. It's amazing how when you study all these different sermons that you preach and you get to them and they, hey, they all lead to the same point sometimes. He said this, then there came again. He said, For how can the servant of my Lord talk with me? For as for me, this is what Daniel said, there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. It's left me weak. It's left me despondent. The vision that I saw, it brought no joy to me. Because I did not understand exactly what he was saying, even though he had come to explain again. But this is the verse I love. And then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. What I want you to know, we'll miss this because this ain't a prophet's thing, but this is a real thing. How many people's lives are been touched, changed by the touch of God? Here's a man that is distraught. Here's a man that does not understand what in the world's going on. Why has he been sick for three weeks? Why, when they tell him, he doesn't understand, he doesn't figure out what they're talking about, and it takes him back to his knees again, and he says, I am so weak, I don't know what to do. There's ne- Listen. We've studied Daniel's life from the time he was about 14 or 15 till here he is now in his mid to late 80s. We've studied his whole life. And all the things that we've studied, we have never seen Daniel shaken so much as he is with this vision. This is something like he's never seen before. If he had seen it before or understood it, He would never have, this is the third time that God had to send somebody to help him get through this. But the one he said, when I saw, there came again, third time, one that had the appearance of a man, and it was he that strengthened me. Many times in the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham, 
God sent angels to deliver messages for him, and many times they were in the form of a man. Many times when he knocked on their door, it said a man stood there, but we all know from studying the Bible and, and trying to get some comprehension of what it says that he was talking about an angel that had come as a man. That that's how he had, had sent him down there. And he says, when this third one came, that he touched me. He touched me. Oh, that old beautiful song that we all know by heart. He touched me. This morning, Peter, when he sank down into the storms and the wave, who touched him? Jesus did. He didn't send an angel in. He touched him. And he picked him up. And he delivered him out of that storm. This is so similar, it just shocked me to this afternoon as I was going back over them. He touched me. But when you look at the Bible, and especially in the New Testament when Jesus was walking on the earth, how many people in the Bible did it say Jesus touched? Think about it. A lot of them that he touched. In the book of Matthew, we read about a leper. Nobody wanted to touch a leper. Incurable sickness. And yet Jesus walked up to him when nobody else wanted anything to do with him, and Jesus touched him. He touched him. Leprosy was what we would call AIDS in our generation would have been what it was in the generation of the lepers there. But the Bible says this, that Jesus reached out and he touched him. And I'll promise you, when Jesus touches you, life will never be the same again. If your life is the same as it was, then you haven't really had the touch from Jesus. Some of us need a, a touch. We've been talking about Peter. Peter was married. Peter had a mother-in-law. She got deathly sick in the Bible. She was eat up with fever, and she laid in the bed with a fever, and, and Peter told Jesus, and, and the Bible says that Jesus went to where his, Peter's mother-in-law was, and the Bible says that he touched her, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered to them. He touched her with the great fever. There are a lot of people in the world today that need a special touch. Every once in a while, we need a new spirit arising in our life to deal with the things that we have to deal with. But one of the things that struck me the most about the touch of Jesus, this was with Daniel, but you remember in the Bible where Jesus went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration and he carried uh, Peter, James, and John with him on that mountain. And his body as we know, was transfigured to something they had never seen, just like Daniel. And what happened when they saw the transfigured body of Jesus? The same thing happened to them that happened to Daniel. The Bible says that they fell at his feet. Same thing. Same thing. It fell at his feet. But it says this, but in a little while, it says they saw no man except Jesus only, and they were afraid. But listen what happened. The Bible says that Jesus went over and he touched them. And those, when he touched these disciples, they went down that mountain, and they were never the same again. They were never, once they were touched, even though they were afraid and troubled at what they saw and didn't understand it, much like Daniel here, it changed their life forever. This was going to change Daniel's life because coming up, we get a panoramic picture of what he saw. 
that troubled him, so what? But I want to say this. Let's look at the rest of it. And next week we'll get into the vision. This is what the man said. He touched him and then he spoke to him. And he said, O oh man, greatly beloved. That's the second or third time that he's been called greatly beloved. Fear not. Peace be unto you. Be strong. Be strong, twice he says. And when he had spoken this, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou has strengthened me. Isn't it amazing that God can turn it around just like that sometime? He told him, God loves you. He told him, you're be beloved by God. Not only are you beloved, but he said, I want you to know Daniel. God's been watching you for almost 90 years now. And he says, you're greatly beloved by God. And then he says in the words, Old Testament, New Testament. What did the angel say that first Christmas? Fear not. Fear not. This angel says to Daniel, fear not. It's going to be okay. Peace, he says. And then Daniel responds to him. And he says, thank you for touching me. Thank you for giving me hope. I was weak, he said, but now I'm strong. I was sick for weeks, but I want to tell you something. That touch you gave me has healed me, and now I am strengthened again because God sent you to tell me that he loved me. Oh, if we ever knew how much God loved us. Four times he uses the term, be strong, don't fear, have peace in your life. Oh, how much we want that. Daniel had been touched by God on many occasions for 90 years, almost. And many of us have had, probably when we were down and out and had issues and stuff, we've seen God come through and we thought things weren't going to make it, it made it, and it got better. Hey, I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been serving God. I can speak to this from experience. Every once in a while, you just need a fresh touch from the Lord. When you're down and you're sad and you can't understand why, we need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. What got Daniel's life turned around? A fresh touch. What got Peter's mother-in-law turned around? A fresh touch. What got the disciples on fire for God as they walked down that mountain? They got a fresh touch from Jesus. Hey, they'd been with Jesus for a long time, but this was nothing like that experience on that mountain. You get there when your well gets dry sometimes, and you need refreshing. You need refreshing. You need lifting up. That song that Cindy sang. God cares much about the lilies, but he cares more about you tonight. And he cared more about Daniel. Now, I don't know about you in closing, but I can speak for Jimmy. And this is just me, I guess. I, I know everybody don't feel exactly like I do. But the older I get, and I'm a lot older than I've ever been. And the older I get, this is a fact. I need more touches from God than I ever did in my life. I need to feel Him and to feel His presence of Him to say to me, Jimmy, fear not. Like that old song says, Shackled by heavy burden. Ever been there? Neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me. 
And now I am no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that filled my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. Wow. He touched me. He touched Daniel. He touched Peter. He touched his disciples. He touched us. And he strengthened them. We need strengthening. Don't, don't you need some strengthening tonight? Let Jesus touch you. Let's, let's finish these two verses next week. I want to get into chapter 11. I'll quit. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I came from? I come unto thee. And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. Satan, the demon of Satan. That fight will never be over till Jesus comes again. He said, I've come to lift you up. I've come to put you back on your feet again. But I want to tell you, the battle's still raging. This may not be the last time you face Satan. He said, I've got to go back right now and go back to battle with him to keep him from bothering you. Thank God for his angels that look out for you. You thank God for them. He says, I've got to go back and get in the battle. I'm going forth to the prince of Greece shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. He said, you can pay attention, but I'm about to tell you, because it comes from the word of God. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. You know, he says, who goes into battle with me? When one of the angels got stuck coming down here, Understand something. God sent an angel to rescue him. And one thing about it, this last one that talks to him, this third one that comes, you know who he knew? He knew Michael. What he's saying there, and I'll just, best as I can turn it, he say, listen, there's a war going on. And I want to tell you something, me and Michael's in this war together. The last thing he says in that scripture, but Michael, your prince, is in the back. He said, I got to go back to fight. Michael's done been here. He's done back. Now I'm going back to join him again. That's what he says. But I just want to close with this, and I'll leave with you. These messages so tied together from to be so many years apart. But the thing it tells us is that our God never changes. It don't matter whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. He's still the same. There were people in the Old Testament needed a touch from God. There were people in Jesus' day that needed a touch from God. And I want to tell you something. In April of 2022, there are people all over everywhere now that needs that same touch. And as the world goes on, as the visions come true, we're probably going to need more touches right now to get through what's coming than we maybe have ever had before. Okay? So next week, thank you for being with us tonight. I love you. I appreciate you studying. But if you need, I just want to say now, if you need a touch from God, all you got to do is talk to him. All you got to do is talk to him. Peter said three words to him, and God came in and rescued him. God don't need a 15-minute prayer. If you want to give him a 15, that's wonderful. But if you don't, if you have a need in your heart, you just tell him about it. And if he cares for the lilies, he cares for you. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you.